Welcome to the Wired to Hunt podcast. This week on the show, I'm joined by Thomas Milsna, a whitetail coach and habitat consultant from the Untamed Ambition. And we're going to be discussing his unique approach to sustainable habitat management for deer and other wildlife. All right, welcome back to the Wired to Hunt podcast brought to you by First Light and their Camo for Conservation initiative. That means a portion of every sale of First Light's whitetail camo pattern, which is Spectre, a portion of every one of those sales is donated to the National Deer Association, something I'm real proud of. And today's conversation is about conservation with our guest, Thomas Milsna. We are getting back into Habitat Month, the month of February. We've talked to Doug Durham, we've talked to Kyle Perry, and today Thomas Milsna, who is a Habitat consultant and whitetail coach with the Untamed Ambition. You can learn more about everything he's got going on at the untamedambition.com. He's got courses, he does consulting, he does videos and all sorts of different kinds of content, a podcast. And Thomas is someone who's got a perspective on whitetail habitat management that I really appreciate. He has a very holistic perspective. As you're going to hear about here shortly, um, he looks at you know improving deer habitat not in a silo. It's it's not about what can I do to make my deer hunting better. It's what can I do to make this whole landscape better. And by doing that, Thomas makes a really compelling case that by doing that, it's going to make your deer healthier. It's going to make your deer hunting better. And it's going to make every other link on that food chain more healthy, sustainable, and long lasting. And that's something uh, that I think is pretty darn cool. I really enjoyed this conversation. We get into a bunch of interesting topics. It's one that I really think you're going to enjoy. I think you're all going to learn a lot from it. And I don't think that I should, uh, you know, beat around the bush here too much longer. I think we should just get to this one because Thomas and I talked for a very long time. It's a long podcast, but this one is full of a whole lot of meat on the bone. I really, uh, I really, really like this one. So without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Thomas Milsna. He is a trained wildlife biologist He has an education in that, and he has real-life applicable experience on the ground doing this stuff. So you're going to enjoy this one. Here we go. All right. Here with me on the show, I'm joined by Thomas Milsna. Thomas, welcome to the show. Mark, good to see you. Good to meet you. Good to chat a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to have this conversation. You're someone who... I've had referred to me several times and you were in the back of my mind. And then recently we kicked off this habitat month and I was trying to think of some folks that would fit into a little bit of a sub lane within the whitetail habitat management world that I'm particularly intrigued in. And as I was doing that research and asking around and thinking about things, your name popped up again. And I was like, oh yes, this is a guy I need to talk to. And I went to Instagram to reach out to you. And then I saw that you had already reached out to me like a year or two ago about this very thing. And I completely missed it, never responded. Uh, I felt horrible about that. So (laughs) I appreciate you being understanding of of me leaving you on red and uh, and being here today to chat. Yeah, I mean, it probably would have been worse if I saw that you read it and then didn't respond. But I can be <laughs> forgiving, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're chatting now. And um, you know, as I mentioned, we're on this series this month of February talking about habitat. And I like to try to you know whenever we do this kind of thing, I like to explore all aspects of a particular topic. In this case, habitat management. So I've talked to some folks who you know are very tactical with you know. How do you put your food plots in this location and your stand locations in this spot? And I've talked to other people who are more thinking, you know, hey, how do we manage our oaks in relation to our this kind of timber in relation to this kind of habitat? And you came to mind as a great fit for this conversation because in particular, something I noticed on your website, a few things I noticed on your website, theuntamedambition.com. I'll paraphrase a few things here, but for one, I saw you say that hunters can save the world by saving nature. I saw you say something on the lines of the fact that hunters have the potential to make a massive impact, a massive positive impact on the world 
by protecting wildlife habitat and promoting healthy native ecosystems. And I will quote you here, in turn, that land will provide an abundance of opportunities for us and our families to thrive, not just with deer and hunting opportunities, but with other nutritious wild bounties, diverse income opportunities, and the all too often overlooked importance of clean air and clean water for generations to come. So those are some pretty bold statements to have on the website right out the gate. Explain. What do you mean by all this? Why is that something that you lead when someone shows up to the untamed ambition? Well, let me let me back up a little bit and give you kind of my two minute elevator pitch on how I got to that point. Right. So my background, I grew up on a farm, a relatively large dairy farm. Actually, you've probably been very close to it because I'm only about 10 or 12 miles away from Doug Duran's farm oh, nice. in Vernon County, Wisconsin. But so my background has always been in land management. And then I actually went to college for wildlife bio, biology and natural resource management. In a strange turn of events, I ended up changing my career path. Uh, my father was injured in a farming accident. I ended up transferring some credits. Long story short, I ended up working for a trail camera company for 10 years. And so I, instead of becoming a biologist, I worked with biologists on the technology side. Fast forward, uh, in due time, I went back to pursuing my passion in biology and natural resources. And it, my passion's always really been with whitetail hunting. Love the allure of big bucks. Obviously, most of your listeners probably feel the same. But once I got into the consulting field, you know, thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna come out, I'm gonna show people my approach to land management. Uh, you know, again, from the things that I've learned over the years in my education, and then also my approach to targeting big mature bucks. Once I got into that space, I was constantly presented with this question of how is the best way to do this? What's the best way to do this? And it just led me down a lot of rabbit holes. And I like to read research papers. I like to dig into a, a lot of different ways of, you know, different perspectives, different ways of doing stuff. And ultimately, the answers to these questions on land management always came back to this more holistic approach. And then you add in the fact of having kids, right? So that's really where this generational sustainable thing comes in, where I kind of shifted away from what can I do right now to kill a deer, you know, and, and therefore what can I help my clients do right now to kill a deer to how do we set up a sustainable system to ensure that we can not only kill big deer in the near future, but ensure that we can kill big deer for generations to come and obviously protect all the resources that produce that, you know, or that provide the ecosystem or environment that grows big, healthy deer. That's kind of how I got to that point. And the holistic approach, you know, the idea of, holistic management is just the concept of managing as a whole. So instead of going in and doing things specifically for deer, which, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say outright, in my opinion, I think that this whole concept of whitetail land management is an overall net negative to the environment. And it wasn't that long ago that I thought it was a really good idea. You know, again, this allure of, oh, what can I do to manipulate habitat and focus specifically on deer? All of that's very, very appealing, but at the end of the day, it's very detrimental to the ecosystems that these animals live in. So that's what kind of led me down that path. And then, you know, my background in general, growing up on a farm, seeing these, you know, local communities that were thriving back in the day, you know, when there was a lot of rural activity, and then seeing them kind of dwindle and the habitat loss that came with the growing expansion of these farms and obviously urban development, yeah. it really made me take a step back and go, oh man, like, you know, how much has changed in the last 20 years of my life? And if we continue this trajectory, what's going to be left 20 years from now or 40 years from now for my kids, right? And, and not just the habitat alone and the hunting opportunities, but also, you know, again, when you look at the water system and the air quality and all the things that go with, you know, hand in hand with our land use practices, 
what where are we going to be in a generation from now and how do we get ahead of that? So that's, yeah. that's really how I got to this point or started to take this approach of analyzing land differently, you know, looking at it from a different scope or different perspective and trying to solve these problems. And then you start to realize, you know, this whole whitetail thing is, is really a pretty minor thing on the grand scheme of things. But at the same time, it's a really, really good excuse to improve the quality of your habitat and also, you know, protect that habitat going forward. And it's a byproduct of it. Again, the, you know, killing big mature deer is a byproduct of a healthier ecosystem that they live in. Yeah. Uh, so, so two things I want to drill into, I, I do want to better understand. Well, let me start with something that caught me there. You said that in your, throughout this journey, you kind of came to the realization that managing for whitetail habitat specifically is a net negative. How do you, how do you figure what, in what way is managing for whitetail habitat a net negative for the ecosystem? Um, and, and then once I understand that, then we can start exploring what the alternative is. That's good for everything. But first in what ways is the status quo whitetail specific way problematic in your view? Yeah. And I, you know, I don't want to generalize too much because there are, you know, whitetail land managers out there that have a similar approach that I follow. You know, they're looking at the bigger picture, but they're dialing things in. So when I say whitetail land management, I'm talking more specifically about this, you know, for lack of better analogy, this landscaping technique that people are employing to put whitetail deer in their lap for hunting, right? And you start looking at some of these situations where you have a very, a, a big lack of biodiversity at the end of the day, you know, so first and foremost, managing specifically for white-tailed deer is a bad idea because white-tailed deer are a generalist species, right? They're, and, and they're pretty far up on the, you know, the so-called food web. So when you start managing for a generalist species that ranks as high as they do, everything below them starts to suffer and eventually disappears. And, and that's a big, big problem. I mean, by themselves, white-tailed deer are creatures of diversity. So when you manage for diversity and obviously native habitat of which they are a product, then everything thrives. But when you manage specifically for the deer themselves and you start looking at things like, you know, how can we feed them very specific monocrops like soybeans or corn or, you know, whatever you're putting in your food plots. And that's not the worst thing at the end of the day, right? But when you start to make that your entire approach to managing deer, then there's a lot of other things that suffer in that equation. You know, one of the things that I bring up frequently when I talk to my clients who oftentimes come to me, you know, again, with this idea that I'm going to help them produce really big deer and, and make it easier for them to hunt. And they've got all these ideas because they've been influenced by other people in the space they start looking at different, you know, call them consultants approaches. And I'm not, I'm not here to throw anyone under the bus, right? I'm just trying to bring some awareness to the situation. But one of the main techniques that a lot of these guys will use, and it's very effective, I mean, I will say that as far as hunting goes, uh, is to separate food from cover. So you ultimately have an area of dense cover, be it switchgrass, uh, you know, maybe they'll tell you they're bringing in diversity by adding pockets of giant miscanthus or something. Um, or some guys will even promote leaving invasive shrubs because it provides really good cover value. And then on the other side of the property, they have all their food, again, generally broken up into various monocultures. So you're separating your food from your cover, which I like to refer to as the habitat approach, not habitat, because habitat <laughs> is the combination of food plus cover, right? So that presents a really good situation for hunting deer because you're forcing them to move to, yeah. you know, go from cover to food. But at the end of the day, it's, it's bad for both ecosystems, right? Your forest ecosystem suffers, your ecosystem, you know, that is in that food plot suffers ultimately too. And also you're not really providing the deer with the quality nutrition that they need to really thrive. And there's a lot of potential issues with that that we're seeing through a lot of research studies as well. So those overall concepts of 
you know, again, that kind of that landscape architecture that comes with deer hunting. I'm not a hundred percent opposed to that, but it kind of goes back to the same thing. You know, I work with some small property owners that don't hunt at all, just trying to increase diversity on their property. Maybe they want more butterflies and birds or whatever it might be. It's the same concept, right? What we're going in, we're trying to replace some of these alien cool season grasses or lawns with more native plants that are going to benefit the native pollinators and local insect population, which in turn benefits the birds, which, you know, that it kind of scales up throughout that system. And then, you know, replacing invasive ornamental plants with native shrubs, again, benefiting all the players in that system and, and actually creating a, a sustainable system in their backyard. It's the same thing we do on a property at just at a bigger scale. So we can have the same type of architecture and create the same type of movement, predictable movement, right? That makes it easier to hunt, but we can do it with natives. The only real difference that I've seen is just this time, the time that goes into the development of it, where, you know, a lot of it is just the the sales pitch of convenience that comes with this magic bean or this process because it's so fast and so convenient, see results right away versus, hey, do these things. And in a couple of years, you're going to see these results and kind of work up to it, but it creates a more sustainable system. So as a whole, again, managing just for deer, I think, is problematic because you, you start to reach a point where you're not really managing for wildlife. You're kind of more so just farming certain species of wildlife, which, you know, if we start looking at the conventional agricultural systems, it's pretty easy to punch a lot of holes in the sustainability of that as well. And, yeah. and that's where I say hunters are on the front line. You know, we're on the front line of conservation. So we have kind of a unspoken responsibility to do things the right way. Yeah. And you made a good point earlier when you said that, you know, deer are generalists. They can actually, in fact, live in many different habitat types with varying degrees of habitat quality and still get by. So what if you are managing specifically for whitetails, you are it's like you're throwing a basketball at a basketball hoop the size of a bathtub. Um, but you have many other species on the landscape that are equally important to the whole that are specialists. There are many insects. There are many different critters out there who are, you know, dependent on specific things, dependent on certain relationships between different animals, different pollinators, different habitat types, all that kind of stuff. So if we don't manage for the specialists, they just disappear. Um, and so like you were talking about deer pretty far up the web, but these other critters down towards the bottom are more specialized, are important and invasive species really do impact them. So, so that makes a lot of sense to me. If we manage for those specialists, if we focus on those natives, all of that kind of stuff then creates a stronger foundation for a healthier deer herd and everything else, you know, around it. That makes sense to me. Um, but but I'd love you to expand a little bit on the the possible positive impact hunters have. I mean, I mean, you're not saying that hunters can just have better hunting. I've seen that on folks, you know, their sales pitch. I've heard people say you can, you know, shoot bigger bucks. I've seen that on, you know, folks uh, Instagram pages. You're saying hunters can save the world. Yeah, you're not uh, saying we I, just kill a, a booner buck. You're saying hunters can save the world by doing this kind of thing. Help me understand that. Help me understand the the power, the influence, the impact that you believe we can have if we look at things this way. Yeah, I think one of the biggest factors there is leading by example, right? So when you start to look at the land in this country and the land use practices. Again, you know we have. Uh, the large or the vast majority of the land is being utilized to grow crops, right? We, we're never going to really get away from that because we obviously have to feed a population. But when you start looking at the rest of the land and you have 40 to 50 million acres of lawn and, you know, 60 million plus acres of paved surfaces, when it comes down to the people that actually own land and want to manage it for wildlife, I think we have a, a very heavy responsibility to do it in a way that 
increases or promotes biodiversity. And that's where that leading by example comes into play. And that what I always refer to as that impact with that subsequent rippling effect. One of the things I tell my clients all the time is community communication creates common goals. So where a lot of whitetail consultants out there will, you know, they use that as kind of a sales pitch of, oh, how to kill your neighbor's buck or how to, you know, hold deer on your property and not let your neighbors kill them. Well, unless you have a really, really big property, we know that that's kind of a line of BS because deer cover a lot of ground. So it's really hard to hold a mature buck on your property all the time. What I preach to my clients is work with your neighbors. When they start asking questions, and we see this all the time. I just last week did another community cooperative meeting where we had a client property. We had some projects in progress. The neighbors started asking questions. And I just tell my clients all the time, and and I kind of preface the whole consulting process to them and say, at some point, people are going to ask questions. And I would strongly encourage you to share whatever you're comfortable with sharing because you're going to have an impact. And the bigger the impact you have, the better your hunting is going to get at the end of the day. Again, I try to use that hunting as an excuse to make everything better. But with that community communication, we start talking to these guys. Now you have one property, you know, call it the, the point of impact. You have one property in the center that we're going through and we're improving all the native habitat. We're taking degraded cropland, improving that. We're taking over used pasture land, improving that all with native habitat. And then these neighbors start asking questions. We tell them what we're doing and why. And all of a sudden they start to look at their property from a different perspective now too. How does that fit into the big equation? How can we make it better for hunting? And then the other thing that I do on that same note is we try to we try to get landowners to cooperate together at the end of the day you know with cattle cattle are a big big part of the equation and in any situation where they're involved they're a very valuable land management tool uh, specifically for nutrient cycling so if we have a neighbor that has beef cattle rather than mowing our native pasture land or what was pasture land is now just native prairie habitat rather than just going in there and mowing that all the time we'll work out an agreement with the neighbor to come in and graze his cattle. And, and that, that's a, a double win, right? Because it costs us less on our inputs as far as how we're managing that land. And the neighbor's happy because it takes pressure off of his land. And that in turn makes his land better because of his carrying capacity can go up now. And it kind of ripples from there. And when you start to see that, you know, outside of that immediate community, then other people start asking questions or, you know, when they, when they ask you your techniques or how you're managing your land, then they are more intrigued. And again, I think we have a big responsibility, not just on improving biodiversity and managing our land appropriately, but also just again, leading by example so that, you know, the non hunter can look at what we're doing and have a better understanding because how many times are you asked that question, right? Like, oh, you're just farming deer. And I and I mm-hmm. get it. You know, people that don't understand it, and even people that do understand it, look at it and like, well, you're just farming deer. You're just doing that so you can kill deer. Yeah. I just had this conversation this morning. I I have this like strange guilty pleasure of starting conversations online with vegans. Like oh, wow. when I'm when I'm bored. Cause I <laughs> I follow <laughs> and I try to do it like tactfully, right? Um, mostly because I'm trying to understand their perspective yeah. outside of just, you know, the virtue signaling that comes with that type of lifestyle. And most of the time they're not productive conversations and, and they are what they are, but sometimes you get into really productive conversations and, and I always bring it up, you know, I am a true animal lover, right? I think most hunters are. And then people always ask, well, if you love them so much, how can you kill them? Right. Then you start to explain like, this is what we're doing. You know, we're trying to improve these habitats, increasing the sustainability, the carrying capacity, the biodiversity. And then we use hunting as a management tool. And the byproduct of that management tool is we can feed our families or the surrounding communities with this extremely nutrient dense meat or you know food that has very little negative environmental impact. In fact, it has a very positive environmental impact. And that kind of brings me all the way back around to why I think hunters can save the world is because they are really the only population of people that own land that are willing to stick the time and money into that land to improve the wildlife habitat without expecting a dramatic 
financial return from it, right? Yeah, we're, we, we're, you know, like farmers are kind of in the same boat, but they always have to have profit at the end of the day. Where hunters, you know, they bought that land for that reason. Yeah, we are internally incentivized already to improve the habitat for the reasons you're discussing, right? Um, and and it's, you know, this is this is a line of thinking that I've been spending a lot of time exploring as well. And, you know, it comes to the scale of our impact. Um, it's not, it's not inconsequential at all. You know, the, the best number I can come up with based off of a land use study that came out a handful of years ago is that there is about 356 million acres of land across the country that's owned primarily for hunting. 356 million acres. That's larger than our national park service lands across the country that we could change, that we can change. Um, that we could do the things you're talking about on and and address, you know, some serious things. Because I think something that we haven't talked about and something I, you know, mentioned probably earlier in this month, but, you know, deer are doing pretty darn good across the nation, right? We're, we're basically in the golden days of deer, but a lot of these other things, those specialists I talked about, those birds and those bugs and, and many plant species and all sorts of stuff, are struggling in many ways across the country. And if we lose that stuff, which we are, you know, trending in that direction, um, then all of a sudden our beloved whitetails are in trouble. Um, so I think there's this selfish incentive, like we want better deer. And then there's this more altruistic uh, incentive, which is, hey, we can make a big picture impact, like you're saying, that's going to help everything. It's going to help our air quality, our water quality, the the health of everything around us. So, um, so, so your, your argument is, is falling in, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say? You, you, you hit me right there where I'm, <laughs> I'm interested, but I guess the thing that I want to explore next is this. If, if all of this sounds pretty good to somebody, if someone likes the idea of it, um, what are the three or four big picture things that we need to be thinking about doing differently on our land. If we want to manage sustainably, if we want to manage holistically, um, I'm sure there's 27 different tactics you could recommend, but what are the three or four philosophies or principles that we need to write down right now? It's like, these are the most important ideas or things I need to learn about or practices I need to start digging in on. Well, I think the number one thing is the mindset. Right. I find myself over and over again, you know, and this is a personal thing when I, you know, I find myself challenged with a decision to make and, and I, I carry a lot of weight on my own because when I'm here managing all these client properties or directing them, knowing that the decisions that I make and consequently they make will affect generations, right? Where, I think that's one big issue also with kind of this mentality of the whitetail land management. It's like, oh, how can I buy land and kill deer? Like we're not thinking about the value of that land outside of deer, which again is another negative. But I always come back to this quote and and I don't know if someone else said it or if it kind of, you know, was a conglomerate of other people talking, books I've read and whatever. But I always tell my clients, every convenience comes at a cost. If, if you focus on that, or not necessarily focus, but always remind yourself, every convenience comes at a cost. And that, you know, by that, I mean, it might be a week down the road. It might be a generation down the road, whatever it might be. We have to, as hunters and as land managers, first and foremost, understand that those conveniences are going to cost someone at some point in time. So cutting corners, punching the easy button, you know, taking those shortcuts in things that in our mind, and I've been there, I've been guilty of this many times. Like, what can I do right now that's going to help me kill a deer? Especially if you're in the middle of the season doing something crazy, right? There's one thing to adjust your habits and make bold, aggressive moves. That's only going to affect you, right? But it's another thing to just constantly cut corners, try to, you know, look for, again, these easy, convenient ways of improving that, you know, habitat situation on your property and then it ultimately it comes back around and, and costs someone or something at some point. And you already kind of hit on that. The specialist species that are suffering from these management practices at the end of the day. Beyond that, it's not that complicated. I think, you know, again, it goes back to that holistic approach, which 
you know, the concept of holistic land management, we're looking at that land and how it functions as a system in and of itself, right? So that's that's really the the hunting layout. And that's how I explain it to my clients. So we can look at that and, it, and you know, this is a big part of what I do where we come into a property and we're not just necessarily consulting on where to put a tree stand, where to put a food plot, where to improve a bedding area, but we're trying to create a system. How can we create a system on that property where, you know, our, our main goal at the end of the day is to at least get our management practices to pay for themselves or balance out in some way, shape or form so that it's sustainable. Because if it's, if it costs us a lot all the time, at some point in time, whether it's, you know, the, the current landowner realizing how much money he's sticking in his property, or maybe he passes on and then his children inherit the property and they realize, wow, I can't really manage it this way. It costs too much. Then they're more likely to just get rid of the property or, you know, develop it, whatever, whatever comes up, right? Again, that dollar, you know, that controls a lot. So it has to be sustainable in that sense. So we're looking at the property, how it functions as a system in and of itself. And then we're looking at how that, that property fits into the bigger system back to that community aspect. And I think that's a big thing people should look at on their property is, you know, we all have this idea where we have to have a bedding area and we have to have a food source and we have to have this and we have to have that. And sometimes that all works out really well, but sometimes with smaller properties, which, you know, more and more with the the price of land itself going up and obviously the, you know, the financial situations in this country, it's going to be harder and harder for for the average person to purchase a big tract of land. So when you start talking about smaller pieces of land, we need to look at how that land fits into the overall community. And that might be, you know, how it produces food for other wildlife in the area. It might be where it fits into the watershed. You know, everyone loves the idea of having their own personal fishing pond, but if we go and we dam up the river or the stream, that's gonna have consequences downstream, right? And also, you know, the things that we spray on the ground or how we treat that dirt, if that dirt ends up in the water, again, we're, we're causing problems to that bigger watershed. So looking at how it fits in the, the big picture, that bigger system's big. And then, you know, we look at the property and how it's made up of smaller systems. And that's really where that habitat comes into play. What are the different ecosystems on that property? And how do we how do we use those ecosystems on the property to our advantage without completely altering or manipulating them? Right. So that there's always some compromise that has to be had. We can't just go in and say, well, you know, ideally it'd be better if the bedding area was over here and the food was over here. So let's go and clear cut this whole area and, or bulldoze it and put in food and then plant switchgrass over here when we, you know, we basically flip flop these, these ecosystems on the property. So a lot of it is working with what you already have and trying to build off the strong points on that property versus trying to, you know, be the hand of God and alter things in a dramatic fashion purely for personal gain. You know, when it comes to the hunting and and being successful in hunting, habits play a bigger role than anything. You know, having the deer there is, is the reason why we focus on habitat again. And that's why we need to focus on the sustainable side of that. But once the deer are there and we have the quality of deer there, then it just comes down to the habits and your approach. Obviously there's some strategy involved there, but Again, we can do those things without sacrificing the bigger picture. Yeah. So if if I'm imagining the typical whitetail habitat management plan of action, I can imagine some combination of, hey, you should plant some food plots. And they're usually going to be some kind of buck on a bag type food plot thing, right? You're going to get some of that. You're going to get some, hey, you should uh, do some hinge cutting or you should do some timber stand improvement, or you should plant some switchgrass, or you should plant some screening cover. Uh, You should plant some apple trees or something like that. Um, You should design these kinds of things in such a way that it encourages deer movement in a way that will benefit your hunting. You should put your habitat improvements in places where you're not going to spook deer when you come in and out. Um, You know, you should add some water. Um, some combination of that kind of stuff with various expansions on any one of those particulars is about what you're going to hear when it comes to what somebody should do with a habitat management plan for white-tailed deer. How is your suggested 
philosophy different than that? Or within those sets of examples, like what would you do differently? Or is it not different at all? It's just choosing the right types of things to plant or not plant or manage or not manage. Yeah, it's it's really not that far from that at the end of the day, because all the things that you touched on there are valuable aspects of a hunting property, right? If, it, if you're buying that property specifically for hunting, then yes, we do want to manage it in a way that it creates more huntable situations. And again, most of that is going to start with opportunity and opportunity comes from the habitat that produces the standard or quality of animal that you're trying to pursue. So my approach, you know, as a whole, you're always going to be better off with a systems type approach versus relying on any one single aspect of anything, right? It's kind mm -hmm. of like, you know, you're, you're going to be healthier if you choose a healthy lifestyle versus just exercising once a day, but eating a poor diet or, you know, yeah. everything together has that cumulative effect. So the way I approach everything is, you know, we'll start, we'll break down the property, visualize everything that's going on. And I do a lot of mapping stuff. So we'll map everything out, what your current situation is. And then we're obviously looking at goals. The next thing we're doing is we're scouting that property to assess the actual habitat types. And, you know, from, from the hunting side of things, we're really just trying to locate pinch points or figure out where we want to create pinch points that are accessible. Because once you have that opportunity, once you've improved the habitat to put deer in your, on your property, then the next key to the whitetail side of things is to ensure that you're not pushing them off your property by unnecessary pressure. So we're scouting to find the best hunting locations that have the least impact on the property. Again, you kind of touched on that. And then the next thing is the actual habitat design. So with that, you know, again, same thing you just brought up. Where do we want to add screening cover so that we have better access? Do we even need to do that in some situations? Where do we want to improve more dense bedding cover where we hold our deer during the day, that daytime security cover? And where do we want to create higher food value areas to draw those deer into? So my approach is very, very similar to most guys, except again, I, I try to always go back to that convenience factor. Like we don't want to just settle for convenience. We want to think about the big picture. And it's really, it's not that difficult at the end of the day. We're just addressing things based on the ecosystems and you know, I, I don't try to be 100% a purist at the end of the day, right? I understand that at this point in the game that we're never going to reach that level again. So I try to follow more of like a 90-10 rule on our client properties where 10% is dedicated to our wants and needs. And the other 90% needs to be focused on the wildlife, though, again, we might manipulate that habitat in ways that encourages certain activities but it's 90% native in various forms and fashions. And then that 10% is what is going to fall under, you know, the food plots and the, you know, more focused on our specific needs at the end of the day. And, and it, it creates a little bit better way to approach things, right? It's, it takes a little bit less pressure off. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I tell my clients the same thing. Don't overthink it. If we focus on native habitat and diversity within that, you, you can't really go wrong. Once we have our, you know, our overall hunting strategy laid out and our design, then you just go back to the native habitat. And, and part of that too, you know, I, I actually work, you know, so my background is in biology, but I'm really, really good at assessing the habitat and the native vegetation in my area, Southwestern Wisconsin. But when I start to go up into Northern Wisconsin, yeah, I know most of what's going on there, but I'm not as good up there. And if I go south, you know, I've got clients as far north as Duluth, Minnesota, and as far south as central Missouri. When I get in those areas or anywhere out of my element, and even sometimes in southwestern Wisconsin, I've got a whole team of biologists that I can network off of that work for the state. They're a free resource. So if I go to them and I already know what I want as far as the structure and habitat types, they can help me figure out the native habitat and those native ecosystems in a way that I don't understand as well outside of what I'm familiar with. So I think yeah. that's important too. So, so it sounds like one of the absolute, maybe the most important principle within the system though, after having a plan and thinking through how these things are all an interconnected system, it seems like a major principle is native. 
favoring native habitat, vegetation, you know, 90% of the time at least. So we've kind of dab- dibbled and dabbled kind of around why native is better. But but can you give me your explicit take on why native, why a focus on natives is better than kind of succumbing to the temptation of the non-native or invasive, which is, you, as you mentioned, usually sometimes at least, sometimes more convenient, uh, it might be quicker or it might already be there and serving a purpose um, to some degree. But but why is native the better option and worth the inconvenience it might take to add it back to the landscape or restore it? The the biggest factor from my perspective is the nutrient cycling within any ecosystem. So, you know, you have all these different species from bugs and insects, plants, birds, all the way up to deer, predators, obviously. If you're not managing the nutrients, then your system is not productive at the end of the day. And that's one of the biggest net negatives of invasives in an ecosystem is they don't fit into that nutrient cycle, right? Nothing consumes them and breaks them down. You know, whenever an animal consumes a plant, it utilizes certain minerals and nutrients from that plant to do whatever it needs to do. And then the byproduct of what it doesn't use is a change in form of the nutrients that it didn't utilize that go back into that ecosystem. And, you know, maybe that byproduct might help to promote growth of a different plant or whatever it might be. So when you have a a non-native in an ecosystem, it doesn't fit into that cycle. You know, for example, one of the things that I say all the time to my clients is good quality deer habitat is for the birds. Like if, if you actually I've focused on the birds. Yeah. If you focus on the birds, you're going to provide everything and more that those deer need from cover to browse and everything in between. Right. And, and that's a huge element of it. So, you know, we start talking about, well, let's just take native grasses, for example. And I'm a, a huge, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very, very against giant miscanthus grass. Uh, you know, and, and I've heard you talk about it before. I think you had a really good conversation with uh, the Native Habitat Project on here about giant yep. miscanthus. And, you know, by definition, uh, an invasive is an alien plant that spreads throughout its environment, right? And has limited competition or it, it limits competition. Some invasives have an aliopathic aspect to them, or most of the time, what we see with most invasives is they green up sooner in the growing season and they stay green longer in the growing season. And when you take a plant that averages, you know, 30 to 40 more days of photosynthesis than all the native competition, it doesn't take long for it to choke everything out with that advantage. Giant Miscanthus, there are those out there, you know, and I have, I'm sure everyone knows who we're talking about. I have a lot of respect for these guys, but they will argue that it's not invasive. Well, if you go back to that definition of what's invasive- Or that it's sterile or something. Or that it's sterile, yeah. But by definition on what's invasive, yes, maybe this plant's not spreading by seed right now, but if it's being distributed throughout the country and planted, that kind of is following the same suit. And when someone's going in and eliminating the native habitat or whatever vegetation's growing to promote the growth of this specific plant, it's kind of accomplishing the same goal, but forced upon nature by the human hand. So when you start to look at that, giant miscanthus, perfect example, right? If you look at, let's compare it to a native grass like big blue stem, okay? There's a lot of bird species that feed on the seeds of big blue stem. Giant miscanthus doesn't produce a seed that feeds any native birds. If you dig a little bit deeper into that food web, there's like 70 to 100 different species of insects that feed on big blue stem at some point in its life cycle. And subsequently, there's hundreds of species of birds that feed on those insects, they actually rely on those insects to feed their chicks so that they have enough protein to grow big enough, fast enough, and strong enough so that they can migrate before winter, right? So if you strip that out of the system and you plug in a non-native plant like giant miscanthus that feeds few to none of those native insects, then you basically clip out the food source for the native birds that would feed on those native insects and or the seeds from that plant, and you completely disrupt that whole ecosystem. So 
you know, back to where I think hunters have a pretty big responsibility. And I see this all the time, this time of year, I'm sure you see it on social media or, you know, maybe I do more cause I'm on the land management stuff, but you always see these ads for land clearing companies. And I mm-hmm. always get a kick out of them cause they always push the same thing, enhance or improve your usable space on your property. And that, that term or that phrase usable space drives me nuts because you know, what is usable space? Again, a lot of us look at it like, oh, it's a lawn where, you know, maybe two days out of the entire summer, we actually take our kids outside and throw a football around versus, you know, what could that actually be to, again, improve that local ecosystem? And we're talking about a hunting property. Every single square inch of that property should be utilized in a beneficial way to the wildlife that we're promoting. And you plug an invasive in there by design, it really only has an advantage for you and you alone. And it has no part in that ecosystem. So again, the nutrient cycling in that system is completely gone at that point with those yeah. invasives. So that's a, that's the biggest reason. Um, so back to the specifics of miscanthus real quick, what's an alternative. So if I wanted to use miscanthus, if that was in my original plan, I was going to use that for screening cover to provide a screen around a food plot or to screen the road or to block a trail so I can walk in without deer seeing me. What would you recommend as a, alternative that is more likely to be native um, and still achieve that same function. Switchgrass is a good one as far as grasses. You know, it's not going to get as tall, uh, but it relatively quickly, you can provide pretty good cover um, as far as screening cover goes. Obviously, there's a, a variety of conifers that will provide the same cover value. Again, it takes a little bit of patience for those to grow and develop. Uh, so, you know, there's that balance there, which is the main reason why most people lean towards the miscanthus if they're in that situation, because, you know, within a few years they get a lot more cover, but again, it's that convenience factor that comes at a cost to that local ecosystem. Those would be the main ones. Uh, when I'm looking at screening in general, you know, there's really two, two things I'm looking at. Are we trying to screen deer from seeing into a certain food plot or screen deer from seeing other deer? Uh, in that situation, there's a, a wide variety of things that you can put in place from, you know, variety of native shrubs, combination of native grasses, uh, all of them are going to create really good structure and cover for bedding or screening. On the other side of that, if you're trying to screen off an area and not, not actually add attraction to it, because you don't want to draw deer into your access route or something, then switchgrass is a great way to go. Uh, but I want to say that and remind people that switchgrass, you know, planted with a no-till drill at a high seed rate doesn't really produce the same native quality of stand that switchgrass would produce in the wild. You know, switchgrass and a lot of these other grasses we're talking about, like big blue stem and little blue stem and such, you know, they're a perennial bunch grass. And when they grow in a more native or natural setting, they provide pretty good cover at, you know, from a deer's level, eye level, or, you know, even on up, uh, but on the ground level, they have this umbrella effect because they grow in a bunch and that provides this whole highway and network of places for ground nesting birds and chicks and stuff to, to navigate through and also search for insects and be protected from hawks and, and other aerial threats. But if you go out and you drill in your switchgrass at a high seed rate, it actually creates a situation where those ground nesting birds can't move through it as freely and it can be problematic. So, you know, in certain situations like a 10 foot wide swath for screening, it's probably not that big of a deal. But if you're talking about creating a whole massive bedding area, going pure switchgrass can again be a problem for the grand scheme of things. Now, on that same note, there's guys out there that will promote killing forbs in your switchgrass plantings, because you, again, this whole idea of separating food value from cover value to force movement, which I think is a huge, huge negative as well. Uh, in, in what we see through that, again, the nutrient cycling is you've got native grasses that have this incredible potential to harbor nutrients from real, real deep in the soil. I mean, you've probably seen the graphics or the pictures of a native grass with like a 12 foot root system. Yeah. And yeah. what happens is those plants, they're pulling, they're mining for minerals real deep in the soil. They pull them up into their biomass. And at the end of the year, 
you know, it's an, it's a perennial plant. So at the end of the year, it dies off or the top of it dies off, creates kind of a thatch layer and all those nutrients break down on the surface layer. And then your forbs with a much shallower root system can, can sequester or pull in those nutrients. And then when your deer come through or your, your ground nesting birds, whatever they might be, they feed on those plants or maybe insects feed on those forbs and the birds feed on the insects, you know, that again, the cycle, then those deer get the benefit from that native grass without actually feeding on that native grass. So if we're constantly killing all those forbs and those plantings of native grasses, then we're just pulling up those nutrients, but they're not really cycling through that system again. And it kind of cuts off that nutrient cycle. So that, yeah. I guess I kind of went on that tangent there, but uh, again, there's, there's plenty of alternatives. It's kind of looking at your specific need. And, and another thing yeah. on the screening aspect is, you know, there's two, two different ways to screen deer from seeing your access. One is screening you or your access route. And the other is just thickening up bedding areas so that they can't see. You know, Bill Winkie talks a lot about that, having thicker bedding areas. And, and he'll say that he would rather have the cover two feet in front of the deer than on the access. I kind of use a hybrid approach most of the time where we just do both, right, as much as possible. And then if if your screening gets blown down from a, a wet, windy storm one day, you still have, you know, the secondary cover in the bedding area. And with that cover in the bedding area, more often than not, you're going to have browse, which is going to provide food value at the same time. So it's kind of a win-win there. Yeah. Um, so switchgrass, you mentioned as a possible screen alternative that takes several of the years to get to a decent height where it actually, you know, blocks the deer's vision conifers, unless you, you know, plant mat relatively mature trees and you've got a whole lot of money to do it. That can take time for something like that to grow tall enough and thick enough to block off a food plot. Let's hypothetically say, um, Let's not talk hypotheticals. Let's talk very specific. <laughs> I I used to plant um, a screen of Egyptian wheat and or sorghum to screen in one of the food plots I've got on a property I can hunt. I haven't done that in the past few years just out of time, um, but I've noticed less deer movement in those plots during daylight as a result of it, especially mature bucks. I used to have mature bucks in those plots feeling pretty comfortable in daylight, and it's not happened as much since I stopped planting the screen. Um, the problem being that this area is, is visible towards some houses and some roads um, without that screen. So going into this year, I, I know I have a little bit more time to get a screen in of some kind if I wanted to, um, but now I'm thinking, man, I probably shouldn't do this Egyptian wheat thing that I've done in the past if I'm trying to manage more in this kind of way. Um, given the fact that I'm looking like, how can I get something or, or is there, what am I trying to say here, Thomas? Is there anything I can do in a single year that will get me some level of screening, knowing that conifers will take time, switchgrass will take time. I've heard from some folks that maybe there are some types of shrubs, like a, maybe a hybrid willow or something that might be native and that might grow fast enough to get something, um, is there anything you'd recommend to, to get me started for that first year that will give me some level of screening ability? Or do I just need to suck it up and, and be patient and know this is going to take a few years? Well, I think it goes back to kind of that mindset too of not necessarily short-term thinking or being overly yeah. patient, but some combination of the two. So what I do with all my clients is we build out a five-year timeline. And you know, rather than saying, here's a plan, go do these things. We break it down into a five-year timeline. And when it comes to the screening, a lot of times what we will do is we will utilize sorghum, an annual grass like that, and we'll plant the switchgrass and or conifers. And then I'll just say, you know, you're doing the sorghum and, and basically you're losing 10 or 20 feet of your food plot for the next three to five years until the switch fills in or the, the conifers reach the appropriate height. And it, yeah. it, you know, with conifers, usually the first few years, they're not doing a lot, but usually by year five or six, they're up there in that five foot, six foot range. And then you gain that 20 feet of your food plot back. You know, the sorghum stuff, it's not the worst thing in the world, but again, to the sustainable side of things, sorghum's, you know, it's a grass, so it consumes a lot of nitrogen when it grows. And obviously when you're dealing with a grass that can grow 15 feet tall in one growing season, it's pulling a lot out of the soil. And then it just ends up, you know, there's a 
big load of carbon on top of the soil, which pulls more nitrogen out of the soil as that carbon degrades. So mm. it can be a pretty expensive or costly crop to plant year after year after year, uh, you know, unless you're in there fertilizing it with a heavy dose of nitrogen every year, which, you know, most guys are using a synthetic fertilizer, which again has its negative side effects. But back to that approach, what I generally would do is we'll say, you know, we're going to do the sorghum here, switchgrass here, conifers here, whatever it might be. And then once the native or the perennial starts to provide the cover that we want, then we can get rid of that sorghum. Now, the only caveat there is, and, and this is this is true for all of our land management, at the end of the day, really what you need to focus on is how you're managing the sunlight and how it hits the ground, right? It's the harnessing the sun's energy. Ultimately, that's what the world revolves around is that energy from sure. the sun. So if you're, for example, if you're trying to screen off the north side of a food plot, and then you go and you plant sorghum along that north side, you know, and the sun's hitting that sorghum from the south first, then you're not going to get as much growth on your switchgrass if you're completely choking it out. So you have to be mindful of that. And sometimes it might just mean, you know, pushing that screen in a little bit further, giving some space for that switchgrass or, or going with a conifer, you know, like a, a white pine or a spruce is going to be more shade tolerant and still grow with less sun versus a switchgrass, which is going to grow the best with more sun. So, you know, in a lot of situations you can get away with it. Uh, you just, again, you just kind of have to be mindful of where that sorghum's casting the shadow if, if that's going to delay stuff. Okay. So, so, okay. Step one or, or point one, one here is don't add invasives to the landscape. If you're planting screening cover or if you're planting trees or a field of cover, whatever it is, let's, let's choose a native species rather than an invasive non-native. Um, but what about when we already have invasives on the landscape? We've got autumn olive all over the place, or we've got buckthorn all over the place, or we've got some kind of grass that's come in. There's all sorts of those that, uh, that can choke out a landscape. If I were to walk out on one of the properties that I've got access to and that I can do some management work on, I think I could spend the whole day pointing out different non-natives here and there and everywhere. And it'd get really overwhelming. Um, how do you recommend someone go about prioritizing what to get rid of? If, if the thing we're talking about next is how do we get rid of invasives that are there, that are non-native, that aren't achieving the goals that you've been talking about, how do I know like what to tackle? Is there, is there some particular couple species that you really think, man, you got to tackle those first, or is there some way to rank order what's on your property or how do you go about figuring out where to start, how much to try to do? What's the most impactful? Um, what's your take on that? Cause it all seems very um, intimidating. Yeah, it's, it can be extremely overwhelming. And, you know, <laughs> the more you learn about invasives, the more you notice them, you know, at least I feel this all the time. You're driving down the road and you just look around and you see them everywhere. And it's, it's depressing really at the end of the day, right? You start to see all these things that, you know, maybe just a few years ago looked like a flourishing ecosystem with a lot of green and life. And then you realize, well, it's actually all invasive and it's not as good as it, you know, we thought it was my yeah. approach, you know, ultimately, you know, again, it kind of comes back to mindset. So first and foremost, you have to understand that at this point in the game, there's no such thing as one and done when it comes to invasive species management. This is an ongoing battle, right? It's an ongoing war, I should say, right? Every year is going to be a separate battle. So the way that I try to do it with my clients, again, we're breaking things down into a timeline. And then generally what we do is we will look at the property and we'll break it down into separate management units. Generally, we'll use logging roads, access trails, or topography to break it down into units and Oftentimes we do that because those, those land features help when we run fire through there. You know, it's an easy way to break it down from the bottom of the hill to this logging road or bottom hill, top hill, whatever it might be. So obviously that goes, it kind of leads to what I was getting at um, with managing them and fire being a valuable tool. And I understand obviously people don't necessarily take to fire easily. You know, it's, it's hard for the average person to accept that and, and that's okay. So what we'll do is we'll break it down into management units. And then I always like to start on the edge. The edge habitat is some of the most productive habitat on a property. Edge habitat is also where most of your invasives are going to show up first. 
And at the same time, it's one of the easiest places to manage. So if we break down a property into zones and say year one, our project list is focus on improving edge habitat on zone one and attack invasives in zone one. And what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll clean up that edge. We'll cut out all the invasives and treat them. You know, that's a relatively easy task. All things considered, you're just following a line, right? That's the beauty of that edge. You're not meandering through the woods and finding invasives at the turn of every corner. So we attack that edge, we get that cleaned up. You know, maybe we are expanding on that edge if we're trying to reclaim some ag fields or something and trying to add more habitat, or maybe it's an actual, you know, an active farm where we can't gain any more habitat. So we're trying to improve that edge and, and push it back into the woods and feather it, right? So we'll go and we'll clean that up. And then if there aren't really many natives on the property, that's when we'll come in and we'll plant native shrubs. You know, we want to look at our local ecotypes as much as possible uh, because they're going to do better in that environment. So we'll go in and we'll plant our native shrubs along that edge. That What that's going to do is it's going to ensure that we have a seed source of natives in the area. And then we'll start pushing back into that property, into that zone. And, you know, again, year one, we're really trying to attack those invasives before we open up that canopy and promote any growth, any regeneration. Because if we do that without attacking the invasives, then more often than not, they're going to take over. But as we remove those invasives and create a situation for regeneration, now we have, you know, and, and fast forward a couple of years when our shrubs that we planted on that edge are maturing and producing a seed source. Now we have the potential of birds feeding on the good stuff and carrying that back in that woodlot and spreading it throughout the woods to help fill in that space that we're creating by removing those invasives. So I think one of the biggest things that's overlooked is going in and attacking invasives or removing them and then just sitting back and waiting for something to happen. That's not the worst thing at the end of the day, but if we want to cover all of our bases, ensuring that we have a seed source of more native varieties, you know, again, we can kind of double up by improving that edge habitat. So one, you know, we're ensuring that we're creating quality habitat on that edge, which is where deer are going to spend a lot of time anyways. And it's also going to draw them up to the front of the property. You know, with that, we start looking at bedding structure and cover. Uh, the analogy I always use is the, the it's a multi-layered cake. The base layer of that cake is our food source. The layer of cover is the icing. The next layer of that cake is the dough bedding. And then to stack another layer on for buck bedding, we have to have another layer of icing or cover. So if we have really good edge habitat, we hold our does closer to the food source, which gives our bucks more space on the property. So that's just kind of the, the strategy, the hunting strategy side of things. But again, setting it up where we're providing a quality seed source going back into that property. And then another thing, you know, when, when you're looking at improving bedding areas, we're doing clear cuts of any sort. I really like to leave a handful of trees stand in those clear cuts. You know, if, if you have a couple good productive oaks, obviously you've got a good seed source there, a valuable food source as well. So we'll leave those. If there are no productive mass producing trees in that vicinity of that clear cut, then we'll leave a couple trees stand and girdle them and let them die. But that encourages those birds to take those seeds into those clear cuts and spread them in the areas that we want. And then again, we get more natives in that seed bank, but we have to always ensure that we're managing for those invasives because again, there's no one and done, but that's where fire is effective. You know, once, once our, our natives are more established within a couple of years, they can handle fire pretty well. Most species of native shrubs can be burned off or mowed off, top killed when they're dormant. They've got enough energy reserves in the roots that they can push up new growth that year. And that growth is more palatable to deer and wildlife anyway. So it's advantageous to, to cycle through that way. You mentioned the possibility when you're doing that edge work of adding native shrubs eventually. I know this is location dependent, but are there any particular favorites of yours in your region, you know, upper Midwest that are particularly productive and, and useful for wildlife that you might recommend? Yeah, I, I love the dogwoods. Dogwoods are great. Viburnums are great. Uh, you know, there's quite a wide variety within both of those families. Uh, elderberries, you know, the red and black elderberry, you know, the 
the red elderberry are more shade tolerant and they're more productive in the shade. And that's why the dogwoods are nice too, because they're relatively shade tolerant. But, you know, you've got red osier dogwood, silky dogwood, gray dogwood. There's some bigger flowering dogwoods, stuff like that. So those are advantageous. It, you know, it kind of comes down to that sun exposure again at the end of the day. You know, like plum, American plum is a really good shrub, but it needs a lot of sun to do well. If you have it tucked in a hedgerow or something where it's only getting a couple hours of sun a day, it'll grow, but it's not as productive. So the viburnums, you know, there's a lot of plants within that family that are very productive for the birds. Um, nine bark is a good one. You know, that's going to be a more shade tolerant shrub. And it, a lot of times I, I like to look around on those properties too. And if you start seeing any native shrubs, which unfortunately I'd say probably 50% of the properties I'm on have no noticeable native shrubs at this point because they've been completely choked out. But what we'll find is a lot of times just going in and clearing out the invasives and managing those, all of a sudden you see some of these natives pop back. So there's generally some seeds in that seed bank waiting for the opportunity to grow. But again, you have to give them an opportunity at the end of the day and and create space for them. Yeah. So, so you mentioned a couple different ways of creating or enhancing cover stuff like feathering edges, stuff like clear cutting. Uh, we've talked about screening, but I've heard you talk about mm -hmm. the way that mature bucks utilize or, or react to good native covers, kind of like a Plinko board. Could you, could you explain that analogy and, and the importance of having that good cover when it comes to hunting? And then if there are any other kind of favorite ways that you like to approach adding or enhancing cover that we haven't talked about. Could you mention those? Yeah. Yeah. The Plinkle board analogy is, is a good one. And I still keep telling myself I'm going to build one of those to give a visual demonstration. But for those of you listening, if you can visualize the Plinko board, right, you've got a, a flat board with a bunch of pegs on it. You drop a disc or a ball from the top and it bounces around and, you know, it just finds a space to drop down on the next level until it works its way all the way to the bottom. If you have a property that doesn't have a lot of cover or a lot of food, then those deer generally move through it very quickly. So that, that ball you drop from the top, it only bounces off a couple of pegs. It, it's relatively quick from the top to the bottom. When you start to add cover in there, and especially when you add cover with food value, then you really slow down that deer movement and hold deer because they have the sense of security along with the food value. And that food is ultimately what's gonna hold them in an area and also define or drive the movement during, you know, the crepuscular periods of the day of morning and night and adding, adding the two or the combination of the two is huge for mature bucks because mature bucks don't really move by random, right? They're always very tactful with their movements. And if you watch them when they move through the woods on un, undisturbed, they're always nibbling on something as they go. And, and I think that's a big reason why a lot of times you're not getting pictures of mature bucks consistently on the same trail as other deer. You know, those does are much more linear with their movement. They get out of the bedding area. They take that same trail out to the food source. They gorge themselves. Maybe they go back in the woods, bed down. Maybe they bed down in the middle of food plot. Bucks don't do that nearly as frequently. They are very tactful and they can't take the same trail as all the other deer because it's already browsed off. So again, adding that cover and food with it is going to ensure that those deer move through the property a little bit slower, they're unpressured, and they just kind of meander through. They feed a little bit here, they feed a little bit there. If they sense any threats, you know, they they see, they smell, they hear something, then they just freeze up. They're still in cover. They've got no problem there. So that's a that's a big big part of holding mature bucks on your property is just having adequate food and cover. Again, that's the element of habitat. You know, if you have topography or you know fluctuations in topography that is the great greatest form of cover there is so you're going to hold deer with that but if you add the food value in there it increases the amount of time that they spend there and, and the more consistent amount of time that they're there and as far as you know improving cover good timber sand improvement you know you can't can't really beat it at the end of the day uh, as far as regeneration goes expanding edges one of my favorite things to do if we are expanding an edge is while the grasses are dormant, you know, right now is actually a good time because we don't have any snow on the ground. It's not really frozen. 
run a real heavy disc through there a couple times to stir up that native seed bank. And then we'll still sometimes go, you know, again, it depends on the rest of the habitat. We still might go in and plug a handful of shrubs in there, but otherwise we're just letting it fill in with native regeneration, which is going to go through succession. You know, it's going to end up, start out with a bunch of forbs and, and annuals, and then, you know, might evolve to more brambles and eventually fill in with trees and shrubs. And, and then we just have to decide how we want to manage it. But deeper in the woods, again, it, it just comes down to that solar management, right? punching holes in that canopy that are big enough where it's not just one year there's light on the ground. It's, you know, enough, enough space where when the trees surrounding that canopy or that hole in the canopy start to release and fill in, it doesn't just fill that hole right away. And then, you know, we, we go back in there five, 10 years later and we don't really see the progress that we want. So with that, you know, again, solar management, if you have a hill, if, if you're on, the south facing slope or, you know, east, west, whatever it might be, you have a huge advantage because the way that that land is pitched, you know, a lot of times you can cut trees on that, the, the crown of that hill or going down the hill and you get a lot more sun deeper into that right. forest on the top versus flat land. You have to cut a much bigger opening. And in most situations, you know, and most foresters I deal with, they'll tell you on flat land minimum of an acre if you're going to open up the canopy or do kind of a clear cut type situation. But again, it all kind of comes back to also what's growing in that area because you know, like, for example, if you're trying to regenerate a poplar stand or Aspen, then you really need to make sure you're getting as much sun in there as possible because it's not going to regenerate without full sun. And then other things fill in and choke it out. And then you kind of defeat the purpose of your, your management technique there. Okay. So, so that's a lot to, that's a lot to think about on the cover side. And I guess the, the obvious follow up then is, are there ways to achieve the other half of the habitat equation in a similar way? You talked about the 90, 10 approach you take maybe to 90% native, 10%, a little bit of flexibility. Um, I'm imagining, and I think you mentioned this, a lot of that 10% then goes to the food side of the equation. Um, food plots in particular. It sounds like food plots, and I may have seen, food plots are still a part of your game, despite the fact that many times they require, you know, introducing a species that's not necessarily native to the landscape. Um, so, so what's your take on using food plots? How do we do it in a way that is more healthy for the overall ecosystem not just whitetail focused. Um, what are what are your principles of sustainable food plot usage in this kind of context? The first thing is food plots should supplement your habitat, right? They shouldn't be the sole source of food on the property because if you if if that is your approach, it's unrealistic because deer are going to consume those food plots pretty quickly, you know? So again, you don't want to be in a situation where let's just use a 40 acre property. For example, if you have a 40 acre property and, and half of it has the potential to be a food plot and the other half has the potential to be cover, but that cover doesn't provide any food value. You, you're probably going to require all 20 acres of that in food to support that herd. And, and at the end of the day, that's kind of the weak link in the situation versus having good quality habitat that provides browse you know, and, and white-tailed deer are going to get 80 to 85% of their nutrition from the browse. You know, they prefer the browse. They need the browse. And, you know, a big part of that too, with that browse that I should touch on is when you start looking at those native perennial plants, shrubs, grasses, forbs, whatever, again, in that nutrient cycle, they have a much deeper root system. So if we address the needs of those deer and, you know, let's go back to the the ultimate goal here of killing the biggest buck we possibly can, right? Again, this is kind of the guise or the excuse of good quality ma management for our habitat. If we want to produce the biggest deer, we need to get a lot of vitamins and minerals into those deer. Native habitat with a deeper root system is going to mine down and pull up a lot more minerals. Once we start getting into those food plots, those food plots should just supplement that habitat in a way that it creates an attractive, nutrient dense and luscious food source to create that consistent movement through the most huntable areas on the property. You know, so there are situations, in fact, even on the property that I hunt, 
on my own most of the time, a lot of my food plots aren't very huntable just given the location, but I'm also competing with 400 plus acres of alfalfa. So the attractiveness of those food plots doesn't really increase until late in the season when the, the attractiveness of the alfalfa declines, right? It's all a relative scale. But on most of my client properties, you know, again, assessing that overall situation, we're looking to add food specifically in the most huntable areas, or maybe not in the exact area we want to hunt, but drawing movement through a huntable area to that food plot, right? You're always going to have the best or increase your opportunities by reducing pressure when you hunt the transitional area between food and bedding, because then you can get in and out without bumping deer at the end of the day. When it comes to the food plots themselves, kind of the same concepts, except to your point, we're not really planting natives in those situations, but they are what I would refer to as more intensively managed situations. So we're not really planting stuff that's you know, at risk of escaping the confinements of our food plot, like, you know, an invasive shrub or something that's going to go to seed and spread by the birds. But we are intensively managing that primarily for the nutrient content of the plant, you know, and, and that's where I, I fold back on the ag industry, you know, the practices within the ag industry for that, because they've obviously perfected that when they have to produce a profit at the end of the day. So, I come from a dairy farming background and I've actually in the last couple of years now worked more and more with companies that are involved in that space because they have the same goals at the end of the day, right? When you look at the similarities uh, on a physiological standpoint from a dairy cow to a white-tailed deer, their nutritional demands are very, very similar. And, you know, so we can look at how do we manage the soils on a dairy farm to produce the highest quality forage for dairy cattle and utilize those practices for deer. Now, on the other side of that scale, we don't necessarily want to manage our food plots the same way that a cash cropper manages his fields because he's managing for a yield and a yield alone, right? And we look at the statistics. I think most people know at this point that if you take a, a cob of corn or a lot of the produce in this country, the way it's farmed, and compare it to the produce in a European country or even what the produce was 20 years ago, the nutrient content is anywhere from 20 to 40% less than what it was. So if we want to, again, get as much nutrition in those deer to grow the biggest, healthiest deer, and at the same time, our ultimate goal at that food plot is the attractive power or utilizing that as an attractive tool to pull deer through certain areas, nutrition equals attraction. Deer are not attracted to soybeans or brassicas or alfalfa they are attracted to the palatability or the nutrient density of that plant. Deer, are, I've said it before, right? They're very diverse creatures. They, they feed on diversity. Are you familiar with Dr. Fred Provenza? Have you ever read any of his stuff? I have not. He, he'd be a good one to dig into. Um, I think his book is called Nourishment. But he, he talks about some studies that they did or he was involved with monitoring domestic populations of sheep as well as wild populations of sheep and how they found this cultural aspect to these herds where the more mature animals within that group would teach the younger animals that they could feed on certain plants that we thought were completely toxic to all animals but by feeding on a little bit of a certain plant it would change the biology of their stomach enough where they could feed on more of another plant, both of which being toxic, but it changes the biology of their stomach to where now they can digest it. And, you know, whether it's wow. a medicinal reason or nutritional reason, you know, there's a lot, lot that goes into that research and I could go on for days about that stuff, but the, the diversity aspect is very important. You know, when we start looking at a food plot, whenever you plant a diverse planting, you're far better off than planting a monoculture on every aspect of it, right? First and foremost, the soil health is the most important aspect of it. So having diversity with that, with those plantings brings diversity to the nutrients in that soil. You know, some plants are gonna harbor nutrients and break down, other plants are gonna utilize those nutrients. So instead of having one type of plant that pulls everything out of the soil that it needs and not really putting anything back, you have that balance with the diversity. And at the same time, from a hunting aspect, it's like, well, are deer going to crave brassicas today or are they going to crave clover? Well, if I have it all mixed together, not only does the clover as a legume feed nitrogen to the brassica plant, 
But now if the deer are showing up for clover or they're showing up for brassicas, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We're all going to the same party at the end of the day. So it simplifies things there. But it all comes down to the nutrients and the nutrient management in those food plots. So the more sustainable approach that I take is first and foremost, trying to wean off of chemicals and synthetic inputs. It's probably one of the um, most important aspects of it. And, you know, I'm not entirely anti-chemical. I think they're a very valuable management tool, but there's a difference between implementation or establishment and an annual routine. And we always strive to have an annual routine that's as chemical free as possible. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the biggest things, you know, obviously one of the most commonly used chemicals the food plotters utilize is glyphosate. Well, we all look at that as a very effective broad spectrum herbicide, but glyphosate was originally patented as a mineral chelator to descale boiler systems and clear out pipes. So what it does, you know, the, the chelation process, if you just think of like a magnet, right? You know, how a magnet can pick up tiny little particles of metal. That's what chelation is. So that glyphosate, every time you spray it on the soil, it chelates minerals in the soil. And now those minerals are no longer bioavailable to the hmm. plants. And therefore they're no longer bioavailable to the animals consuming those plants. So again, if we go back to growing the biggest, healthiest deer, we want to get as much nutrition in, in, in them as possible. At the same time, glyphosate's an antibiotic. So it disrupts the microbiome of the deer if they go and feed on anything that you spray and even in the soil. So, so I know I'm kind of interrupting your stream of thought here, but I, I, if we want to reduce our synthetic inputs, so that means reducing our use of herbicide and reducing our use of, you know, chemical fertilizers, which is for most everyone, that's just fertilizer in general. Um, what, what's like the alternative? Um, what's the more, or what's the sustainable moderation of that? Um, I know you mentioned like making it not an annual practice. I've, I've tried to do this. I've tried to reduce my use and I've, I've achieved that to a degree as I've instituted a number of more regenerative principles to my food plots, but I still, have, I'm still kind of like needing to knock down the weed growth at least once with herbicide. <clears throat> and even though I'm doing several cycles of like two cycles of plantings throughout the year, and I'm, I'm never trying to wipe clear the whole menu off and I'm trying to maintain, you know, cover on the soil and I'm trying to follow the principles of soil health as, as much as possible. I still seem to need, some degree of additional fertilizer to get that boost, especially when, you know, it's dry, we're not getting a lot of water and the crop's struggling. And I'm like, man, I've got a failure of a food plot coming in here. And so I then feel like I got to put something on there. Um, so I've yet to really knock it out of the park is what I'm getting at. Um, is that just a reality of this, that it's going to be a challenge and sometimes it'll be better, sometimes it'll be worse, or is there some better way to do it um, than what I'm describing? I don't think there's a silver bullet solution, right? So I just want to preface this with that because, you know, I, I'll, I'm going to explain how we approach it, but it's, it's a relatively simple approach, but at the same time, every situation, situation is unique, right? So for me to just say, do these things and you can wean off of all your synthetics, it's probably very achievable in your situation, but maybe you have to alter the approach. So yeah. You know, I, I mentioned before that whenever you have a systems approach, you're always far better off than relying on one specific aspect of whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. And at the same time, let's bring back the whole idea of every convenience comes at a cost, right? So why do we use chemicals as much as we do? They're convenient, right? It's mm -hmm. the easy button. Yeah. Most people... And I would argue, you know, and, and I'm not, again, trying to throw anyone under the bus because I've been there many times, but I would argue that the chemical application used in food plots is far worse than the conventional egg model because most food plotters aren't overly precise with their application rates. You know, their timing's not the best. It's, again, it usually comes down to, oh, wow, I've got one weekend to get this food plot in. I'm already behind the schedule. Yeah. I'm going to go out. I'm going to mow it, spray it till it, whatever I can do in two, three days time. So first thing would be coming up with a better system in general, 
you know, an annual routine is going to be an important thing and understanding the timing element of when you're planting, when you're disturbing soil, whatever it might be. The next thing comes back to the soil itself and having healthy soil, having a, a balanced ecosystem in the soil itself is going to produce a situation where weeds aren't as much of a problem, right? What, the biggest thing people overlook with weeds in a food plot is weeds are generally, I shouldn't even say generally, they're always there because of the soil itself, right? They're there to heal something in the soil. Hmm. Now you might have some noxious weeds in there that are just really good at filling in space, but they're healing something. It, you know, maybe you disturb the soil and that's nature's way of creating cover to protect the soil. Maybe there's a mineral deficiency or a nutrient deficiency in that soil and those weeds are showing up to sequester or harbor those nutrients to fix and put that soil back in balance. So that's, that's the first thing you have to understand to get away from the chemicals because every time you disrupt that ecosystem with chemicals, you take another step backwards. And that, you know, that's where cover crops, like you're talking about cycling through cover crops, planting more diverse species at any given time versus a single monoculture all the time, that's going to help balance out that ecosystem. But one of the things that I've been doing the last couple of years and a, a company that I've worked with now pretty closely for the last year, uh, Midwestern BioAg is the name of the company. And the reason I was drawn to them, again, the dairy background and understanding the soil ecology and how important that soil health is, they produce fertilizers that are a manure-based, homogenized, and remineralized fertilizer. So their whole approach is a systems approach to agriculture. And what I love about them is they've got a ton of data and all the numbers to prove the systems approach. And actually at the end of the day, their approach is more cost effective than the conventional approach because they can go in, you know, we can dial in these fertilizers to balance out your soil. Once you reach that, call it state of homeostasis in that soil where things are more balanced and, and equalized, weeds aren't really that much of an issue. And then when you go in there and you plant a crop, it has the advantage because you placed it at the right depth at the right time, you know, given the right amount of moisture and everything. And it's going to more often than not outcompete the weeds. At the same time, if there are some weeds, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where we have to understand that a lot of times those weeds, you know, we call them weeds, throw up air quotes, but more often than not, they're a native plant that you're going to feed on anyways. And a lot of times they're as high or higher in nutrient content than a lot of the crops that we plant. But the the nutrient compounds or the the makeup of these fertilizers are a huge, huge advantage. And that's why I've really started to, to love them more than anything. You know, I talk about nutrient cycling in general. Well, if we back up, you know, not that long ago, a few hundred years ago, up until a few hundred years ago, our habitat was managed by large animals, right? You had everything from woolly mammoths, which were actually, you know, obviously gone a lot longer ago than a couple hundred years, but all the way up to like bison that were just eliminated a few hundred years ago. Those large animals had the role of creating disturbance, which created space for regeneration, but also they move nutrients around mm -hmm. those ecosystems and across the landscape. We don't have that anymore. So, you know, a lot of times what we see, and, and I, I think a big reason for a lot of the invasive issues is we just don't have as nutrient rich soil as we used to have in general, you know, even in a, in a forest ecosystem that's well managed, you're still just cycling through the nutrients in that system. And you never have the added bonus or, or, you know, thrush of nutrients that's brought in from an outside source. And now with these fertilizers, which is again, why I love them is we can go and we can basically spread manure that's been, it goes through a, a digestion process. So it's broken down to its most usable form. All the impurities are removed. We have that, it's pelletized and homogenized, so it's even. We put that on our food plots. Now we're putting real nutrition into those plants or into the soil, which ends up in the, in the plants, which ends up in the deer. And now those deer are distributing those nutrients throughout the habitat on our property versus a synthetic fertilizer that really promotes growth, but doesn't promote nutrients, right? It's kind of those empty calories. It's like I can go grab fast food and, and fill that void of hunger, or I can eat something that's actually got nutrition and it's going to benefit my body. But the difference is, again, you have deer spreading those nutrients throughout the rest of the habitat. 
And then all your habitat gets better from there on out too. So again, it all comes back to the soil in the nutrient cycling in that ecosystem and the surrounding ecosystems. And those deer are now the, the landscape managers or the vegetation managers of that habitat. And we're just there kind of overseeing what can grow and what can't grow, but they're ultimately moving the nutrients through that system. What was the name again of that uh, fertilizer company? Midwestern Bioag. And is that something that's regional or is that something that's, that's more widely available yet? It's widely available. Um, actually, I've, I'm working with them right now and we're trying to solve logistical problems to get smaller quantities to food plotters mm-hmm. for this exact reason. Uh, they're, they're actually located in Southwestern Wisconsin. And so, so, and they, they distribute throughout the entire country. In fact, some of their bigger research trials were done in the Dakotas. So, you know, you're taking a, a completely different climate with relatively poor soils and they can get those soils balanced out with these fertilizers to where they're, they, they, this year, I think they set multiple county yield records and in doing so they've dramatically reduced the chemical inputs on these fields. Hmm. So that's a, you know, that's a big, big positive to me, but you know, this kind of comes back to, to the deer side of things. Again, if our ultimate goal as a deer or habitat manager is to produce the biggest, healthiest deer possible, then getting real nutrition into those deer is obviously a critical element of that. And when we start looking at the soils in any given area, the nutrient, or the lack of nutrients, I should say, that's happening more and more with row crops because of all the added synthetics, this is a way to ensure your herd is getting high quality nutrition and minerals back in their diet without congregating them around a supplemental food source or a mineral lick. You know, and obviously there's advantages and disadvantages to those things, but I often will use the analogy where, you know, You can take a multivitamin every day, but we know that you're far better off getting the nutrients that you need through the foods that you eat versus just popping a pill or drinking a supplemental drink every day. So that's kind of the same approach we take. Let's get the nutrition in those deer through these perennial native food sources and through truly nutrient-rich food plots, which again, it's going to create a really, really strong source of attraction because of the nutrient content there. And that goes hand in hand with our, our ultimate goal of creating that huntability on the property. Yeah. And then to the, to the ultimate, ultimate that we discussed earlier, which is the whole ecosystem health, uh, by managing for more nutrient, more nutrient dense, ve- ve- yeah, more nutrient dense vegetation, which comes from the healthier soil, which is a byproduct of not using as much chemical as not tilling as much, not using synthetic fertilizers, all those kinds of things don't end up you know, running off into your waterways. They don't end up being, you know, chemicals drifting onto the native vegetation adjacent to those food plots and killing the milkweed, killing the forbs and flowers, all that kind of stuff. So it seems like by doing all these things that lead to bigger, healthier deer, in this case, it is also helping the rest of the ecosystem. So this is one of those things where it, it really seems to be the best of both worlds in that managing your food plots in this kind of way is very whitetail specific beneficial and also very whole ecosystem focused in such a way that it's, that it's like a a positive feedback loop, if you will. Um, it's hard to argue with from that perspective. Yeah. And, and, and I can take that up even another notch because one of the things that I'm doing now with my clients, you know, a lot of these recreational properties have some component of tillable land on them that they lease out, or maybe, you know, it is a farmer that has recreational property. We're actually reevaluating a lot of these land use contracts and trying to work more closely with the farmers to utilize these fertilizers too. Because again, if we're eliminating the chemicals going into that local environment, it's reducing a lot of those problems. But at the same time, if we're going to grow crops in the surrounding area and we want the biggest, healthiest deer possible, and those deer are feeding on those surrounding crops through much of the growing season, then, you know, we want more nutrients in those crops at the end of the day. Yeah. So that's a, another big advantage there. Um, one other thing to note, you know, from the conservation standpoint with hunters and this particular fertilizer company, another reason why I was drawn to them, this fertilizer is produced in a 
carbon negative manner. So it's, you know, it comes off of a dairy farm that has a surplus of manure and it goes through a digestion process. It's broken down by microbes. And during that process, methane gas is given off. They capture all that methane. It powers generators that power the entire manufacturing facility for the fertilizer. And then a byproduct of that, when they separate the water, they reuse the water to irrigate the fields. So there's a huge advantage on that side of things versus all of your synthetics that are you know, mostly petroleum based, right? Where there's the carbon effect there. So, you know, whether, whether you're concerned with the carbon cycle, you know, and this, the climate issues that are shoved in our face all the time or not, this goes back to that leading by example, where if, if you get approached or you get in some sort of confrontational conversation with a non-hunter trying to tell you that the things you're doing are just to kill deer, you can fold back on this and explain like, well, actually you're not wrong, but look at the big advantage to all the things that I'm doing oh, yeah. versus, you know, and this is the conversation I have a lot of times with <laughs> some of these vegans, right? It's like, I, I look at myself and I think all hunters are this way in some way, shape or form, but we are the frontline conservationists, right? We're actually out there actively trying to solve problems, be it small on our properties or larger, like I'm you know, approaching many properties or many communities. We're not just standing out in front of a courthouse with a picket sign, shouting things about climate change. We're actually you know, actively working to improve food security and sustainability of these ecosystems. Yeah. And like you said, sequestering carbon along the way as we plant these grasslands and manage native vegetation and all that kind of good stuff. So we're, so we're hitting it on all, on all, uh, all cylinders. One question around a specific here, back to the, uh, you know, the ways that we are managing for soil health which is at the foundation of a lot of these things. Um, if we're trying to establish a food plot or if we're trying to remove an invasive species of some kind, usually the two options are either chemical disturbance or mechanical disturbance. So we've already talked about the downsides of chemical disturbance, but sometimes needing to use it. We haven't talked as much about the downsides of mechanical disturbance, but you know, as you know, and as we've talked about in this podcast in the past, you know, repeated disking, tilling, aggressive disturbance of the soil in that kind of way does break down the, the life of the soil, significantly reducing the, the ability for it to produce nutritious vegetation down the line. So one of the things I wonder about is, is we got to pick a poison though sometimes. We, we could either disk and till something to get rid of a weed or to open up a food plot or to get rid of a grass that's taken over a prairie, or we can burn it down with glyph or something like that with an herbicide. If you had to pick your poison metaphorically, one of those two, like which is, which is less negative or vice versa, which is the less, which is the more positive option? I, I have to pick that poison many times a month. You know, every time I write a plan with implementation, we're picking that poison. I, I look at it from a situational standpoint, right? If a lot of what I do is in hill country, we don't really want to go in there and aggressively turn up the ground because there's obviously a huge risk for erosion there. So we are utilizing the chemicals, but again, we do it in a way where we're usually out of that routine or out of that cycle within a couple of years. And that's another way I kind of pitch it to my clients is we try to look at the chemical application as a credit-based system. If I tell you, you've got three credits to burn, use them appropriately. Don't just go out all willy nilly and spray, you know, not the best timing, like use them appropriately. So you get the most effective kill. Usually within three applications, we can reduce or eliminate most of that weed competition. And then we get that soil balanced out. But again, there, there's no silver bullet solution, right? So once we get the soil, you know, getting that soil balanced out, I think is absolutely critical. Because once that soil is balanced out, everything else is a lot more manageable. But, you know, if it's been fallow ground for a long time or it's in CRP and CRP, you know, I like CRP in general, but it's a reserve program or a resting program. It's not a re rehabilitation or regenerative program by any means. So a lot of times CRP ground is pretty bad ground. You know, it's been over farmed. 
they plant it in native grasses. And a lot of times you'll see the CRP never gets very tall at all. Those situations, when you go in there and try and add a food plot, there's a lot of nutrients that are missing from those soils to get it to where we can grow that crop. Ultimately, once we get it to produce a healthy crop, again, that crop is better at out competing the weeds and keeping that soil balance in check or that soil health in check, which gets away from it. Now, one thing that I've learned, and you know, if we would have had this conversation a couple of years ago, I would have pushed hard for a no-till regimen, right? And I think that's a, a pretty strong talking point. It's a pretty common talking point mm -hmm. with food plots. And in most situations, I would still tend to lean towards that, even though on the conventional ag side, no-till is not a it's not a long-term answer or not a foolproof answer because there's a lot of other issues at play. Again, nutrient cycling, ground compaction, water infiltration, stuff like that. So those guys in a lot of situations are going to have to till. And, you know, so when you're driving around the countryside thinking from a food plot perspective, no till is the best and you see someone tilling or turning dirt, every situation is different. You know, in, in Northern areas of the United States, if, if these guys don't turn the dirt, in the fall, it doesn't dry out or warm up fast enough in the spring to even get a crop planted mm -hmm. with the short growing season they have. So that's part of it. But what I've learned in working with companies like Midwestern BioAg and gleaning information from these guys who have farmed organically or using what they refer to as a biological systems approach, what I've learned over the years is that light tillage has tremendous advantages and the reason why that always kind of stuck with me or was appealing to me is back to the sustainability standpoint, right? It's, it's unrealistic to expect all the guys out there food plotting, you know, it, you know, what's the average food plot size, less than an acre, yeah. quarter acre, you know, maybe a guy is fortunate and he's got three or four eighth acre, quarter acre plots on his property. I'm not going to expect those guys to go out and buy a no-till drill. And at the same time, a lot of guys, most guys like to DIY things. So they're not going to want to go hire a land manager to come in and pay them a bunch of money to, to do a no-till drill. So in those situations, and even in situations where they have options, light tillage, very light. And I'm talking like the top inch, inch and a half max, incorporating the organic matter or thatch layer into that top inch is advantageous. It's going to improve water infiltration. It's going to help break down the organic matter and feed the biology in the soil faster. And it's going to eliminate that weed competition without the use of an herbicide. The, you know, we, uh, soil health guys talk a lot about the, the mycorrhizal fungal layer, yeah. right? Yep. That layer lives sub two inches. Mm. So if you go and you bust up that top one inch of soil, you're not really affecting that fungal layer. Now, having a thatch layer there is still advantageous. And again, understanding your situation, you don't want to go and till on a hillside, especially if there's rain in the forecast, but having healthy balanced soil, you know, trying to maintain as much ground cover as possible at all times and incorporating that residue into that top inch is going to promote a lot of growth. So you get that weed competition out of the way promoting or accelerating the growth of the crop that you're actually planting. So, you know, again, there's two avenues to look at that, but I, I just like to say that or bring that up because most guys out there exit the conversation on soil health. As soon as you start saying no tilling is the best way to go. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that although I think no tilling is very advantageous in a food plotting situation, you know, again, all the elements at play, the timing aspect of it can be a lot more lenient with no-till. But if you are in a situation where all you have is a, a light disc or a tiller, that's good too. Just don't go so deep. I mean, I, th I think the biggest issue is we like the idea of turning the dirt until it becomes this like fine powdery medium. Yeah. But in doing so, we completely destroy all the soil biology and we also destroy the soil structure itself. And we cause a lot of problems that way. So one of the things that I do, and I, you know, on most of our client properties, we are doing no-till um, or very light disking. On my property here by my house, I've never sprayed my food plots. They're right next to where my kids play, not far from my garden. I've got a beehive back there. I just don't want to have anything to do with it. But what I do is every year I go out, I've got a kind of a perennial basin there of alfalfa and clover. And then I'll go out you know, late summer, fall food plot time. And I take a rototiller and I set that puppy at about an inch 
and I just go through it one time and basically I clip the root crown off of the clover and alfalfa and it sets it back. And then I plant my fall blend and you know, that fall blends nice cause you've got uh, grasses in there like rye and oats and stuff that germinate relatively quickly and they, they fill in and then the brassicas and the peas and stuff fill in after that. But you get a really nice fall plot and there's a lot of nitrogen sitting in the soil available to those plants because you had that living root there the whole time. And then this next spring or the, the next spring, the rye fills back in and, and it'll slowly mature and die off. And that clover that was there fills back in. Clover and alfalfa are, are relatively hard to kill. You know, it, it, most guys probably know if they've tried to kill it, sometimes yeah. the wrong timing or just one shot of glyphosate won't even kill it. So yeah. you can get pretty crazy with your tillage if you don't go too deep and you're not going to kill that. And again, the idea is to really just set it back long enough to let that initial crop fill in. And then, you know, it becomes a kind of a perennial cover crop at the end of the day yeah, like and, that. and it works out, it creates good ground cover. And, and again, we're, we're, we're doing everything we want to do as far as following those six principles of soil health, but we're doing it in a way that works for our own system. And that's, you know, another reason why I love those fertilizers, because you, you talk about those six principles, the sixth principle is animal integration. Well, how do we integrate animals into our food plot system for, for really good soil health? We actually do that in some situations. I talked about the beef cattle earlier. In some situations, we will actually go in and we'll drill in or broadcast food plot seed into our cover crop, our warm season cover, and then we'll dump cattle in that food plot for 24, 36 hour period, let them smash everything down, spread the nutrients around, integrate the seed, and then we pull them out and we get pretty awesome food plots that way. But again, it's not feasible for most guys. So these pelletized manure-based fertilizers are the next step there in a more manageable way to have that same level of animal integration as far as the nutrient cycling goes without having to worry about you know, the, <laughs> the inconveniences of moving cattle across the landscape. Yeah. Well, Thomas, I... We joked before we started recording that if we weren't careful, we could go for six hours. And, and now I'm realizing that was less of a joke and more of a quite real possibility if I'm not able to stop <laughs> myself. So I'm going to say uh, we should wrap this up, but we have covered a lot of really good stuff. And it seems like there's a lot more to talk about. Um, so we might need to get you back on for a return visit sometime down the line if you're up for it. But before I let you go, um, where can folks go? to learn more about what you're talking about here today, your courses, your other resources. Um, how can folks learn more from you? Because obviously there is a lot we can learn. Yeah, the untamedambition.com is my website. Uh, we're actually in the process of kind of overhauling that to incorporate those online courses a lot more. Uh, but you can find me there. You can reach me through that. Email me, thomas at the untamedambition.com or Instagram is where I'm probably the most active when I am active on social media, uh, the untamed ambition. So Sweet. yeah, if, if anyone has any questions on anything we talked about today, I mean, this is what I do every day is answer questions. So <laughs> feel free to reach out and I'll do the best I can. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, Thomas. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. You were the right guy to talk to. I'm glad this worked out and, uh, let's do it again. All right. Thanks for having me, Mark. All right, and that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. Thanks for joining me for this one. I hope that you believe that uh, you know I provided what I promised, which was a podcast that I thought would give you a lot to think about, a lot to learn from, and a lot to carry forward into your own habitat management efforts this coming spring. So thanks for being here. And until next time, stay wired to hunt.